Welcome to the Archive Room podcast. Faster my, I'm Judith Lay and I'm very pleased to find you waiting for me at the door to the Archive Room, the place where we keep stories of island life in years gone by, told by the people who were there. So come on in, sit down and make yourself comfortable and let's listen to this week's selection. It must be around 25 years ago that it seemed as if we were going to have a film industry right here on the island, making full-length feature films destined for cinema release. The location managers arrived, then came the film units and crews, and then the actors. Then the excitement of going to see the Brill Cream Boys, hardly able to follow the story for trying to recognise filming locations, spotting prized possessions that had been loaned after island-wide appeals for props, not to mention searching each scene for our friends who'd signed up to be extras. But what was it really like if you allowed your home to be used as a filming location? That's the question Geraldine Jameson put to Kathleen Morrie, who allowed her 17th century farmhouse in Andreas to be used as a film set. But actually, this wasn't a new experience for Kathleen. Well, it's not the first time. We were approached for the Brill Cream Boys, uh, but that was an outside shot that was done on the airfield at the time when one or two prisoners were actually attempting to escape. So that was an outside shot, but it was great fun even then. We were known to Phil Gates, the location manager, and uh, he liked our house. He would like to have done something with Brost Farmhouse before, but it it didn't actually fit in with anything they were doing. But this one was quite suitable because the film they were going to do this time, which was known as White on White, needed two parallel drives. So we had those and it fitted the bill. Well, unfortunately, I've not been privy to the whole story, but the part that we were actually involved with was an art gallery where an artist was having an exhibition. And unfortunately, he met a very untimely death in a motor accident. And in order not to spoil the the general sort of appeal of of the uh, show, they considered it was better to hide the body and not even say that he was actually dead. So they wanted to secrete the body away and brought it in a car up to our house. It was known as Jeff's Cottage in the story, which was an unused home, well hidden away. They could bring the body and take it through the house, through the hallway, down into the cellar, and it was then put away in a deep freeze. (laughs) And as they were making their getaway, the police were in hot pursuit coming up the other drive, so with the editing out and so forth, they could actually make it sort of quite exciting and and, and full of tension to see all this chase going on. Now, this is at the dead of night. Night, wasn't oh, it? it was during the night, yes. And there was a, a, an amazing engineering feat to recreate moonlight. Oh, it was simply wonderful. I understand from the director and the people working on the film that they they engaged the finest lighting person in the business and no expense was spared, apparently. He just wanted lights here, there and everywhere. And the garden was just like fairyland. It was super. They brought over a, a cherry picker which could stretch to 145 feet in order to angle floodlights, big arc lights, from the top, of, right over the roof of the house, and this is a three-storey house, mm. right onto the trees and through the garden, and it was absolutely phenomenal. The so there were proper were lights. Oh, yes, great mm. big arc lights. The lighting is absolutely superb. But isn't it extraordinary, Kathleen, when you think of it? You know, a few minutes' worth of material for the finished production, and I believe they were there for three days. They were... I think we probably will be featured in this film because it was a it was a very important and integral part of the plot. But one may miss out altogether. We just don't <laughs> know what happens, what falls mm-hmm. off on the cutting floor. Why was it called White on White? Does that include it all? I don't know, actually. Originally, it was to be called Ripley's Art, which was a sequel to The Talented Mr Ripley. But anyhow, it may well have another title before it is released even. These things do change. Yeah. You probably know this, but I understand 51% of the film has to be made in the Isle of Man if they're working under the Manx Film Commission. But some of it was certainly being made in France and some of it was filmed 
in London. I think it was Victoria Victoria Station. Some of it was filmed. So it isn't... And then, of course, some in studio as well. But I'm sure you'll be looking for it anyway, whatever the, whatever's <laughs> going to be called. These people come with enormous maze of vehicles, ranging from mobile homes, camper vans, lorries, trailers, cables, and they bring their own security too, don't yes, they? Yes, and also a big catering department, because all this staff and all these stars and, and, and uh, officials all have to be fed for the duration of the shot. And they want to keep them on site, oh, really. Oh, yes, they do. Well, we were fairly... Well, we are lucky, really, because the farmyard is, is large, uh, but also we're adjacent to Andreas Airport, and so they actually put the unit onto the run onto the peri track there, so the access was excellent, yeah. and they ferried people backwards and forwards. The mere fact that it was within walking distance mm-hmm. was neither here nor there. They still had their own cars to, to to trip them backwards and forwards. And now, what about the security? I mean, it must have been a joke, really, for you and your husband to be accosted by a security man at the end of your own drive. Actually, Geraldine, I was never out, so I don't know what happened at the end of the drive, but I presume I may not have been able to have got back. (laughs) (laughs) You're a bubbly person, of course, and you love people, so I think you'd have enjoyed every minute of it. But other people might not just have taken too kindly to it, you know, people tramping through their, their home. Well, I think one is made very aware of of what happens during these things, but it can still extend a little further than one is perhaps led to understand. Um, for instance, uh, yes. For instance, our kitchen was taken up, which was <laughs> could be rather <laughs> awkward because the flood lighting was actually set up in the kitchen in order to beam it into the hall to be able to do the inside shots. Um, but they were very, very hospitable to us, and of course the the um, the refreshment van was on hand, and that they're. they're their catering is exceedingly good. So we were welcome down there to go and have whatever we wanted. But it pretty well closes down your home life. And also, um, it pretty well closed down a lot of our farm life too because our, our family couldn't get in and out with agricultural vehicles through the yard because these huge pantechnicans were in there. Yeah. It was pretty well filled with lighting and props and all the gear that goes with it. I mean, do you have uh, farm animals? No, we haven't. Ah, No, we've no livestock at all. No, we're purely cereals and pulses, so it wasn't a matter of milking or getting the milk lorry up Mm -hmm. or anything of that kind. And did you get to know the people at all? I mean, what about the directors or the leading men or the leading actors? I didn't actually speak with the artists very much, but you see, it is a bit fragmented. For instance, William Defoe, appears in this film, but he didn't actually film on our section at all. Whichever part he was taking wasn't in our little bit. We had Douglas Henshaw and various ones who were quite well, quite well known in the field. In fact, Tom Wilkinson had played in The Full Monty, and he played oh. a part. And Barry Pepper, he was a very dashing young man. He was one who was hauling the body into the house. But the director and the producer and the general lighting and sound staff, they were super and we had a lot to do with them because they were there for the duration, whereas the artists were probably only called in at very short times and they were doing their own thing and probably only on call for maybe a half an hour or an hour at the outside. I know when Brooklyn Boys was done here, there was a party at the Grand Island afterwards and and we were invited for, for the rap and that was lovely because that was pretty well filmed entirely here I think yes it was but with this one being in various places they probably did the rap in 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 Elstree or it wasn't here anyway that was Kathleen Morrie chatting with Geraldine Jameson 20 years ago about her experiences when her Andreas farmhouse was used as a film set the world of work and its changes over the decades was always a strong theme in David Collister's excellent Time to Remember programmes. John Kelly spent all his working life as a butcher in Peel, and when I spoke to him, I asked him how things had changed over the years, especially people's eating habits. And half the people eating out now when on Sunday. All mm. the pubs, pubs is all eating houses. When I started, boiled stew and mince. Really? You know, now yeah. they want good steak and... Uh, Leg chops. Yeah, well, people expect more today, don't they? Well, yes, yes. They want it cooked for them. Mm. The young ones wouldn't know what to do with the pot. they got a whistle on the kettle now, so they know it's boiling. <laughs> <laughs> That's the modern trend, Mr Callister. Yes, uh, it is. Yeah. Yes, it is. Get worse, maybe. You know, everybody has got BSE. Uh, 
blame somebody else. But I call this BSE, blame somebody else <laughs> when you can't get <laughs> what you want. That's what it is. You know, every, you can't get the root of it. <laughs> no. Just to go back, because it's interesting about these, these early days, how many, how many butchers do you be in competition with a few others? Six or seven, Beal. Was it? Yes. All right. Yes, there was. Who were they then? Josh Kenyuk. Yeah. Dale. Kenneth Garrett. Stanley Woods. Willie Quail. Jack Quail. And Doug Leash. Did these animals, when they were getting hauled into the back of the shop, did you ever get any that ran away? Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Tell me about that. Another got out of Kenneth Garrett's yard into Johnny Kelly, the pram shop, into his greenhouse. Was this a cow? A uh, beast. Yeah. Yes, a bullock. Well, what do you do to get them out? Get Josh Kenyuk's cows mm. and drive Josh Kenyuk's cows up the alley yeah. and get them all together, drive them to the slaughterhouse, pick that beast out and... Right. Uh, Take the cows back to Westview, where uh, Queen's Drive, where all Jossie had all his fields there. Yeah. It's all houses now. Uh, yes. You must have had to uh, employ staff yourself in the butcher shop. Yeah, oh, yes. And all my staff was excellent. Kel and Judy, Jesse and John Mull, talk nice to them, and they'd do anything. <laughs> yes. So I always say, can I talk nice to you? Well, Jesse was there for over 20 years. Yes. You know, she was good, smart, good head on them, but yes, she was. Yes, Judy was good to help. Day well, by day, though, you'd be actually working at butchering, would you? Yes. Day? If you seen me down the street, it's only for a haircut. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't ever down the street when the shops were open. No? No. What other sort of trades people would there be in Peel that you remember um, that you in, in those times? I mean, what sort of shops uh, other than butchers and bakers? And... Well, when I was in Castle Street, we had the Curtis, the fish, going ding-dong all the summer. Uh. And we had Tia the Taylor, John Garrett, the grocers, Hunts, Sweets, Cadence, Tamer Cadence, Vegetables, George Sell, the painter. You know, Gail's coaches, Johnny Kelly's, all gone. And the place must have been full of uh, full of the Fisher girls as well. Oh, it was, Kipper girls, yeah. well eaten at Wellington, outside every, nearly every house. You know, that. Uh, yeah. and now half of them were brought up on Kippers. They were bringing seconds home from work. Now, the young ones wouldn't eat birds and heaven or Kippers. The young ones, they wouldn't. Uh. I was brought up on them and rabbit pie. Which was the worst job then for a butcher to have to do? The one that did anything you didn't like doing? Skinning heads, lamb's heads. <laughs> yes. There must have been a lot of people who were very unhappy about you closing down then, wasn't there? Well, the ones that was coming sometimes were sorry. Mm. And I said, I can't live on somebody coming sometimes. You That's said. the way it was going, was it? Yes, yes. You, you know, that... Half the people are going to Tesco's now. Mm, There's right. no baskets going shopping now. Mm. But you want a car boot to go shopping today? I uh, go to Ramsey sometimes on a Sunday for them, and I, I'm never in supermarkets and just have a look, you know. That mm. What's in the thing first? Ale, pop, ice cream, biscuits. Mm. They were luxury in my young days. Time to remember there with John Kelly as he shared a few words of wisdom with David Collister based on his experiences as a butcher in Peel. Snaefelt in Wold Ben McCree Fourteen ships have sailed the sea Proudly bearing a Manx name but there's one we'll never again. Oh, well, and Vanin of the Isle of Man Company. Oh, well, and Vanin lost in the Irish Sea. Many of us were sad to hear the news of the recent death of folk music legend John Kinnean a dancer, musician and presenter for over 40 years of the popular folk show here on Manx Radio. John was a great character, a valued friend, always happy to share his music knowledge and a story or two. But I wonder how many of us know that without John, this song might never have been written. Oh, well, and Vanin, of the Isle of Man Company Irish sea. 
John Kinnean's love of Manx dancing and folk music began in his school days and, as many teenagers did in the 1950s, he also discovered skiffle. As soon as he was old enough, John spent most weekends in Liverpool visiting the folk clubs and it was there that he met the Liverpool-based spinners who had a folk club and were mixing American skiffle with folk songs and sea shanties. John soon progressed from going to Liverpool to listen to music to performing there himself, still keeping his strong friendship with the spinners, who at this point were turning professional. John knew that spinners group member Huey Jones had a particular interest in Songs of the Sea, and it was John Kinnean who gave Huey a booklet about the steam packet. In it was a story about an old steam packet vessel that had been sold and become a Confederate boat, John suggested to Huey that this would make a good subject for a song and left the booklet with him. But the Confederate boat song was never written because it was in that same booklet that Huey Jones read the story of the Ellen Vanin tragedy. And the rest, as they say, is history. Oh, Ellen Vanin, lost in the Irish. Manx men now remember the third day of the month December, a terrible storm in 199. Ellen Vanin sailed for the very last time. Oh, Ellen Vanin of the Isle of Man come. Huey Jones of The Spinners, with the song he might never have written had it not been for the group's strong friendship with our own John Kinnean. David Collister often discovered that chatting with a group of people would spark off lots of great memories, and that was certainly true when he went to Glenside and talked about the years before and during the Second World War in the company of Molly Agnew, Flo Cooley, Emma Skelly, Phyllis Cowell and Stan Cannell. We'll we start with Molly then. What are the earliest things you remember, Molly? Well, when I went to Modish Road School from coming from Africa and then, of course, we only used slates and there was little scratchy pencils with them. Then uh, later on, as we got a bit older and the war was on, we were taken by our teacher out to gather foxgloves, which were used for some sort of medication for the war, and also sphagnum moss. They told us that was used. Put over after the wound had the dressing on, the moss was put on to keep it moist. And then, of course, when blackberry time came, we all had to go, the class had to go out and gather blackberries for Russian Abbey. Now, that was to make jam, of course. That's it. Yeah. Did, did you ever taste Russian Abbey jam? Oh, yes. Yeah. Each sherbang that came with a coach load of people was given a jar of jam to take home. Oh, right. did, that was did, did you have strawberries and cream, don't Russian Abbey? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Peaches and cream was just uh, strawberries as well. We had peaches and cream. It was lovely. Very good. Yeah. Yes. yes. There was only paraffin lamps and yes, candles right. to bed. Yes, yeah. we had the candles, candles to go to bed. That's it. And, of course, all cooking was done on one old stove. Yeah. Where were you living then, Molly? Oh, various places, oh. because we'd only come home for the year. Yes, you'd been in South Africa. You were born in South Africa. Born there mm. and came home for a year's holiday mm. and got here two months when war broke out. But... Mother had brothers on farms, so we went and stayed on the farm, and I helped to make the bands for all the stooks. Yes. And also, uh, we used to go up the mountain and fill the sacks with turf, and my cousin then would bring them down on the flat platform driven by a horse okay, down, yeah. bumping down the mountain. Right. Yes. Let me go to Flo and Emma for a bit now about the school days. I mean, what, what do you remember, Flo, about your school days? 
I went to Hanover Street School, and it was a mixed school for boys and girls. Up to seven years. Up to seven years. Yeah. When you got to ten, you could pass an exam to go to the central classes, yeah. and that was at Tumble Street. And you went from Tumble Street from 11 till you were 15. You were supposed to go till you were 15. Did you learn all you needed to at school? Well, I was sewing there, and a lady the name of Miss Jane Leach came along wanting an apprentice. She was shown a nightdress I had made, and I was asked to start work the following Monday. Oh, right. So I got my first job first there. Job. And only job I ever had. Really? How long did you have that? Well, only about eight years, because yeah. I married after oh, yeah. that. Yes. And, and Emma, what about you then? What was school like for you? Very good. What were the teachers like? Were they tough? Yes. Yes. Especially in the senior, say, class four mm. on so to six. Yeah. few people get the cane then, did they? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Only the boys, though. No. No, no the girls got on the knuckles. Oh, I've had the cane. Have you? Have what you? were you doing for that? Okay. I've had it for being late. I, I had to bring late. a younger sister with me, oh. and I couldn't hurry her. And by the time we got to the school... The door would be closed, Mm. and we weren't allowed in until after assembly, and then we'd have to be sent straight to the headmaster's, and then we'd get the cane for being late. Mr Hall. Well, you're the the most recent to visit the school stand, being only, what did you tell me, 79? You're the youngster here, aren't you? I'm the youngster. (laughs) You weren't actually born in the Isle of Man, but with a name like Cannell, we'd expect you would be. Yeah, my father was amongst me. My mother came from St Downs. Yeah, I was born in 1920. What do you remember of school then? I went to Onkin School. And, and what were school days, happy days? Oh yes, quite happy. I was lucky I never had the cane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you see. Yeah. And we lived in Governors Road for a while. Then we moved to Mountfield Road in Onkin. Yeah. I left school at 14 and I went to serve my time as a painter and decorator with my father. That was my career from yeah. the age of 14. Stan, uh, what about the war then? I mean, were you in a reserved occupation as a painter? Oh, no, no. it wasn't reserved. I, I uh, served in the army. I was a sergeant in the Pioneer Corps. Were you? I was in East Africa, Northern Ireland and Egypt. What was that life like then? I mean, you'd be quite young when you went to it. It was all right. I was lucky. I wasn't involved in any of the fighting. It just happened that uh, our corps wasn't in it, you know. Yeah. Mainly supplies and things like that we were on. Now then, ladies, what about the wartime then? What what was your, what was it like for you? Oh, it was the blackout. We can remember the blackout that very well. Oh, that well, well, wait a minute. People who are listening to this wouldn't know what it means. What does a blackout mean? But every window had to be covered. Mm. No lights, no street lights, no, no lights, lights any, no shop windows lit no, up or anything. You just had to take a torch and go round if you want to go out. Yes. Well, what happened if you had a light showing? You were fine. Fine, tell yeah. me. knock right. at your door. Yeah. Uh, they may give you a first chance like, but they'd be after you again. Yes. We'd spend time in the home at nights making rugs from our old rag mats, you know. Yes. Cutting coats and things up. And I used to go to the Strang to my grandfather and I had an aunt there that used to knit socks for the soldiers. And when they were finished, I had to take them down to, I think it was Mulcrease, a big house at Union Mills, and get more wool for her to make more socks. What else about the wartime then? I mean, food, for instance. Well, food, we were on coupons. Each person had so many clothing coupons. Half two slices of bacon for a family. Yes, and fruit was out of the question. Only got it on your ration book. Yes. If oranges come in yeah. or a banana come, you get a banana. For children, tomatoes, she had to queue up. The oh. farmer always called. Yes. And before the war, we had always bought Manx butter off him. And lucky for us, he still kept this pound of Manx butter coming. Even through the war years, he still brought us a pound of Manx butter, which was a great help. It allowed your marge to make a cake or anything if you wanted to. David Collister remembering the years before and during the Second World War with Glenside residents Molly Agnew, Flo Cooley, Emma Skelly, Phyllis Cowell and Stan Cannell. And sometimes even the most exciting and interesting jobs don't go as planned. 
and we're finishing today with a conversation I had in 1999 with group captain David Schooler, who, with his wife Meg, had just moved to the island to join the Advanced Airship Corporation. Well, I decided the time had come to leave the RAF for, it was about 15, 16 months ago now, and uh, just as at about that time, um, the Advanced Airship Corporation here on the Isle of Man were looking for an experienced test pilot. And cut a long story short, I I joined the company. And uh, quite fascinating. I'd never dealt with airships before. Um, mm-hmm. They've got quite a lot in common with uh, heavier-than-air aircraft. Mm-hmm. Um, but certain differences, essentially based on the gas laws. But absolutely fascinating because we're, the object of the exercise is to build an airship of higher performance than anything else in the world today. And there are two ways of doing it. One is to get the speed up, and that's done by reducing the drag to a minimum and... Um, they're putting in sufficient installed power. And the other is to increase the disposable load, the useful load. And that's done by um, discipline in the careful control of weight and using modern materials uh, in the envelope to ensure that you've got a light but high-strength envelope. So that's what we're aiming at at the moment. And it has been quite fascinating, uh, after all these years in test flying, mm. to actually go back to the start of a project and work your way through so to speak, uh, relatively speaking, from square one right through the development of the test program, the systems and so on. And we hope to put it all together just about the end of this year. And uh, I shall, please God, then have the privilege of flying it. Well, as we know, the project didn't go forward. But maybe that's the added value of our archive, there to remind us of the characters and all the events that make up the rich tapestry of island life over the decades. And I'll be back scanning the shelves of the archive room for more fascinating and funny stories to share with you at the same time next week. But for now, let's turn off the lights and close the door. You can listen again to this and to all the programmes in the previous series of the Archive Room by subscribing for free to the Archive Room podcast at manxradio.com or via your usual podcast provider. I'm Judith Lay saying thank you for listening and wishing you a very good evening. The Nation Station Manx Red